In southern Mexico, a single highway connects the two southernmost states, both of them rich in traditions. That highway takes us from spicy food and mezcal to marimbas, sinkholes, Oh, I gotta get another photograph, actually. Oh, boy. And parachicos. The road from Oaxaca to Chiapas. Funding for In the Americas with David Yedman was provided by Agnes Howry. Funding for In the Americas with David Yedman was also provided by the Guilford Fund. Oaxaca in southern Mexico is internationally famous for its incomparable food. It's brilliant textiles and it's mezcal. And this is one of the principal mezcal producing areas. Here we have the entire post-Hispanic distillation process. The original liquid that's already been fermented goes into this distillation tank. Distillation tank is heated, evaporation begins and reaches in here, and the pressure causes a condensation to occur in this pipe. It then comes over here to the cooling snake, as they call it, the culebra serpentino, and that is immersed in cold water so this goes down and the distillation that occurs and by the time it comes out the spout it's liquid it's actually mezcal this is the product that we age we allow it to sit for some time we then have the quality of aged mezcal in this case we add cream to it and it is processed fermented and distilled with some fruit added East from Oaxaca, we leave the mezcal behind and all the central valleys and the cool climate. The eastern part, where the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is, is hot, and it's a completely different culture. It's a different world for the rest of Oaxaca. Cowboy. The great civilizations of Oaxaca developed in the central valleys. At the eastern end of those valleys, the land drops off abruptly into canyon country like this. It separates the isthmus from the rest of the state. And it was a place the Aztecs found very difficult to conquer because of the rough terrain 500 years ago. The highway from Oaxaca to Chiapas passes through one of the great desert landscapes of the world. In this area right here, there are three different columnar cacti found nowhere else. What's amazing to me is that in about 1490, 30,000 Aztec soldiers were able to pass through here en route to conquering Tehuantepec through this thorny, grabby, spiny, nasty landscape with no domestic animals, they somehow managed to get an army through here. I don't know how they did it. At the entrance to most cities in Mexico, you'll find a statue of some general, a hero, a macho figure. 
It's very different in the isthmus, especially in Huchitan. A Tijuana with iguanas on her head. <laughs> One thing that stands out in Huchitan and all of the isthmus is the flowers that you see the women have embroidered on their blouses and are painted on the buildings. It's a symbol. In this place, the women are in charge. It's a matriarchal culture, and that makes all the difference. The isthmus of Tehuantepec roughly connects the state of Oaxaca with the state of Chiapas. It's Mexico's waste. It's the narrowest point. As a matter of fact, there's long been discussion of building a canal connecting the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific. Because it's a narrow waste, it has a very different kind of geography and a different culture. It's sort of where Oaxacan culture ends and Chiapan culture begins. These springs, which originate in the limestone mountains way behind us, are called Tlacotepec. It's an Aztec name. But the Zapotecs had been here for about 500 years. About the year 1000, they began to develop a civilization here. And they always found this place much to their liking. In about uh, 1480, King Coyoesa decided that this was the place where he wanted to be when he took a vacation. He had to fight off the Aztecs, and it took him a long time, but eventually they came to a truce, and this place became sacred for the Zapotecs, even into the area after the conquest by Spaniards. And it's very popular today with people from the Isthmus. This is the park of the Marimba in the capital city of Chiapas, Tuxla Gutierrez. It's a big city of almost 600,000 people, and it's not very traditional. It's a new city. But what it does more than any other place is to celebrate on a daily basis the importance of the Marimba. This is the Marimba capital of the Americas. So this orchestra here is only 15 or 20 years old. Before that, there was no music in the evening. When the first marimba arrived here, it found its home. About 20 years ago, in this park, we began to promote the marimba so that local people could stop by and enjoy themselves. Now, we perform 365 days of the year. Great migration. Ah. It's so bass, harmony or guitar. Yeah, melodia. Then there's here's where the melody is. Melodia. Melodia aquí arriba. Triple. This is the triple. You have to hit these really hard to get notes out of them. A long time ago, Africans were brought to Mexico as slaves. One of them was a musician named Black Marimbo. He brought with him a little marimba of only one or two octaves. It was small, and it had nothing besides the natural, no half notes. He played it over a hole in the ground. He would put the marimba over the hole, and just like that, the hole gave it resonance. Below, they have these projections, which are resonators. They call them pumpas. They're like organ pipes. But this little hole here is actually made with a very fine thread made from pig's intestines. It apparently gives 
add some dimension to the resonance. So why a pig intestine and not a cow intestine? The answer is it has exactly the right thickness to give the, the vibration that they want and produce a resonance. If they use cow intestine, it would just deaden the entire sound, too thick. The marimba has European origins. But not far from Tuxla Gutierrez is a small city whose origins lie in Mesoamerica. We arrive at Chapa de Corso late at night and find artisans working round the clock, getting ready for their upcoming festival. Well, I'm lucky enough to be able to get inside the workshop of one of Mexico's most famous mask makers. Antonio Lopez Hernandez, and he is known everywhere for the extraordinary mass he made primarily for the processions and the celebrations in Chapa de Corso. He only makes um, eight to 10 masks, new masks every year. The bulk of his work is in restoring old masks, most of which he made. So he's repairing his own work. And there are some here, for instance, from back in 1970 that people have had. They bring them back to him to get made refreshed so they'll look sparkling new and sleek for the festivals. These masks are not representative of Spaniard. They're, they're representative of Europeans, perhaps from the early 18th century. They're not an ancient theme. This will take a certain amount of getting used to because the eyes, the eye slits are quite small. It was made to entertain, to distract a lad who had taken sick. He was the son of Doña Maria de Anguño, a Spaniard. She came here looking for someone who could heal her son. Here was a potential benefactress, and they had nothing to offer. But that was when they arrived, wearing the mask, and made her dance wearing the mask to distract the child from his illness. It was at that point that the town dedicated itself to St. Sebastian and the mask then became associated with the festival of St. Sebastian. It's, it's sort of a, a, a symbolic convergence of events and the town now is ferociously dedicated to St. Sebastian. And so in the middle of January of every year when his day comes up, they have this enormous and lively and energetic celebration. And it all goes back to the masks that were created to distract an ill little boy. So this town of Chapa de Corso is a, a fiesta town. I don't want to say a party town, but it almost sounds like that. There are only three months of the year when there isn't one festival or another going on. And so that's part of their essence, their soul. And uh, Don Antonio wants to make sure that that tradition continues. Right now, we are seeing how participants are getting ready to dance through the streets to recreate once more the tradition that is of the Chunta here in our town. Along with them, they will be carrying the important symbols of our town. For example, they will carry a basket filled with little flags that together signify the reunion of all the neighborhoods of our town. This parade of a few hundred persons is a bizarre event. It's confined to people who are dressed to represent the servants of a woman 300 years ago who was extremely important in the history of Chapa de Corso. She liked to have her men servants dressed as women. And so this is a recreation of that tradition. So they have marched maybe a quarter of a mile from where they gathered and are waiting outside the church, but they are not by tradition allowed in the church because they're the sermon class. Tomorrow, when the Parachicos, who represent the original people here, the Chapanecas, who are uh, an indigenous people, they will be allowed in the church because they're the authentic representatives of the entire region of Chapa de Corso. This is just one of numerous parades, desfiles they call them, that will be part of a week or so of rather wild partying. Every one of them seems random, but they each have the role to play in the fiesta as a whole, celebrating the very deep background of this town, which has an indigenous history 
of people that nobody knows anything about. And they are now expressing that, and they're extremely proud of that tradition. Many of the people who live in this town have Indian roots. They don't know exactly what they were, but it's clear that this was an Indian town. After dawn, the revelers in the fiesta need to rest and recuperate. We take advantage of the lull in the action and the morning light to visit one of the geological and archaeological wonders not far away. So this huge hole in the ground, this massive karst, actually has cave formations still beginning here. And we can see the stalactites coming down on the other side as the water still filters through. They call this the top. 200 million years ago, this was a cavern. The entire ceiling was intact, really. Then a time came when the ceiling grew fragile due to the cracks caused by seeping water, which opened the cracks like these. And then the whole ceiling collapsed. It just sunk. The top remains this great hole, the sort of collapse geologists call karsts. Then the parrots discovered the place and found it ideal for nesting. They began to feed the chicks here. As they fed their babies, seeds would fall to the bottom, and gradually the bottom has become reforested. So I'm dangling here just to four or five hundred feet above the bottom of the hueco, as they call it, the whole la cima. So you can see the, the painted hands. Somehow, the old timers got themselves lowered down here. How they did it, unless things were very different. It's on an indentation, and you can see the red. I, I, they had more Kurds than I would ever. Awesome. Ah, then on the edge of the outcrop there, you can see a, a snake of some kind. The archaeologists have pronounced them to be at least 10,000 years old. And maybe 10,000 years ago, the bottom was not as far away as it is now. From the top, the deepest point over there, it is 140 meters deep. The diameter from here to there on the other side is about 160 meters. Its circumference is 500 meters. Well, it's suspenseful. It's a good view of the, the bat hawks that I've never been able to see before. Mm -hmm. You can see the hands. There's one of his pair of hands, right and left. And they would hold the hands up against the ceiling, like this, and get a mouthful. Or maybe they would have a straw full of the powdered cochinilla, that red dye from the prickly pear. Hold their hand up, and poof, blow through that. And it would leave the outline of their hands. And that red lasts forever. If it's not, if it's not getting eroded away, it will dye the rock. Oh, I got to get another photograph, actually. Oh, boy. <laughs> The images of the Manos are striking symbols from previous millennia. And we return to Chapa de Corso just in time to see symbolism that is perhaps ancient as well, but now reflected in the pageantry of a city, the Parachicos. The Parachicos who are assembling here range from about eight months in age to well over 60. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them that are going to participate. The hat is made of maguey fiber called isle. So the inside, from the, the agave fibers, the isle, it is actually tied together, a very painstaking process. This is a fairly new two-year-old color, but as it gets older, it darkens. Some of the helmets that we see are dark colored. That means it's aged, and after a certain point, it's time to get a new one. The ribbons represent the, uh, the region of Chapa de Corso. I can't conceive of the, the talent that goes into producing this. All the native fiber from the Americas, the agave. The dresses that the women and girls wear here are called chapanecas. 
which is the people who were here for centuries. They are elaborate affairs, very, very expensive to make, time consuming, and they are heirlooms. So they are handed down from mother to daughter, to granddaughter, to great granddaughter. Even the ones for the little girls are kept for generation to generation. They're a real family heirloom, a treasure. And if you see them up close, you wonder how anybody can possibly make them. And you see why they're so valuable. This dress that she has, she herself has put together and had other people make. So if you look very carefully at the embroidery, and that's all done by hand, there are various local symbols. You've got an example of the Pila here, the great fountain of Chapa de Corso. A marimba player, and if you go around, you'll find these are very carefully collective memory of the city. An initial ceremony, say we're getting ready, we're getting energized, ready to go. The local saying is that you can't become a parachico, you are born a parachico. And this is a, a good proof of that concept. There's something in the blood of the Chapanecas, the people from Chapa de Corso. This is part of their expression of being from this place. So the Parachicos identify them, not only for their hometown, but with their culture. This is a very distinct expression of a cultural value that is very deep and goes back hundreds of years. The patron is the spiritual guide. He is the person who directs the group. He has to figure out how to get all of the neighborhoods of the town to work together and make a united fiesta. We can say for the stage that this is the space that belongs to the whole town. The people, the actors, the participants, they all fill the streets with cheers of Chiapa de Corso and when we start to dance and run through the streets, people open their doors to join in and dance and enjoy the event. You almost need to understand chaos theory to figure out how these groups get sorted out. But it's more a matter of individual choice than anything else or friends. They begin with a group they want to be in, and it will be a relatively small group of, say, 100 or so. Then they all meet for lunch as one big mass, and after that, the group goes out en masse to make a parade, and people keep coming in, more parachicos keep entering. It's organized chaos. We are talking about more than six or seven thousand people dancing. Aside from the families that participate, we're talking about the boys that dress up like parachicos or the girls like chapaneca. I mean, the spirit of the fiesta takes over the town. The town gets behind everything that has to do with the parachicos. Along the way, they make various stops that are indicated by the traditional director of the, of the procession. And they go in, stop, make an offering at that house, and then move on, all in the direction of the church. That's the final destination. One of the stops that the Parachicos will make, and they are coming now, is this room that is especially theirs. It's the room of the Enramadas. Enramadas are long strings tied together of basic fruits and food. Most of the things we see up there are post-Hispanic. We see bananas and pineapples and watermelons. There are also numerous offerings of objects that people are adding to their enramadas as a, as a gift to the saint, particularly in this case, St. Anthony. Traveling from Oaxaca to Chiapas, one encounters the greatest diversity of cultures, languages, geology, natural history, fauna and flora 
that you can find anywhere in the world. Join us next time in the Americas with me, David Yetman. A majority of the Southwest United States is desert. Water is scarce and found mostly in a few rivers and streams, but they are becoming exhausted. A few people here and there are working on ways to confront this slow disappearance of our water. Their work is vital to every Southwesterner. Funding for In the Americas with David Yedman was provided by Agnes Howry. Funding for In the Americas with David Yedman was also provided by the Guilford Fund. Copies of this and other episodes of In the Americas with David Yedman are available from the Southwest Center. To order, call 1-800-937-8632. Please mention the episode number and program title. And please be sure to visit us at IndieAmericas.com or IndieAmericas.org.